I'm the result of this generation. You pioneered efforts against this sort of thing. But you look back over the course of 30, 40 years. I study it historically because I haven't been alive all that long. You have. You, <laughs> and I mean that in a serious sense, of course. I, uh, you oh, fought these battles. You wrote the books. Um, here come you know, Michael and I and Adriel, this whole generation under 40. We grew up in the age of biblical illiteracy the seeker-driven movement. Church was about everything but proper expository preaching or unpacking the text faithfully. And I, I think, to your point, the result is then an entire generation of people who they want sound bites, they want simple, they want basic, and you start going into, you know, you need to read your Bible. You need to study the bill for yourself. They don't know how to do it. Mm. An entire generation just showed up to church and was told, here's five ways to be a better you. Mm -hmm. Here are two ways to change the culture in your community. And it was, you know, feed the poor. And believe me, we need to feed the poor. And it was, you know, go on a missions trip and we should go on short term missions trips. But everything was about me suddenly. And so I know there's this guy who wrote the book Crisis Christianity. I know (laughs) that there's a lot of great work out there. But that is, I think, in my estimation as a younger pastor, what I'm dealing with the most, Adriel, probably you too, is people that you show them things, and it's fun to watch. They're going, that's always been there? Mm -hmm. Or wait, oh, so that's how I'm supposed to study that passage. Biblical literacy is almost foreign nowadays. So that's both exciting and challenging. Exciting because there's people that are getting saved Mm -hmm. and seeing this for what it is. Two, we've got work ahead of us, and we we need to follow on kind of your coattails and, and labor to that end as well. Well, I appreciate all that you guys are, are doing in this. And I just think of, uh, you know, the, the, the point that you're making, Costi, reminds me of Jeremiah 23, the false shepherds. Mm-hmm. They, they all say, I had a dream. I had a dream. <laughs> and God says, I don't know this guy. Yeah. <laughs> I never sent him. Yeah. He never stood in my council. You think of the apostles. They stood in the council of the, of the Lord for three years. Amen. They walked with him. They heard what he said. And he promised that. When he ascended, he would send the Holy Spirit so they would recall everything that happened. We have a sure word, and Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Amen. I haven't, I, I'm not telling you dreams and visions that I, you know, have, have made up in order to, uh, in order to uh, steal the sheep away or to, to drive them away. I'm gathering the sheep. I'm laying down my life for the sheep, we have a good shepherd, and he places under shepherds beneath him mm. to lead us into the, the green pastures of his word. Amen. What could be a more wonderful opportunity in life than to lead the Lord's sheep into green pastures? And you guys are sure doing that with, you know, a lot of experience under your belt of what false shepherding looks like. Mm. It's a privilege, no greater privilege. 